it is using our stolen work to take our jobs. It's uh, the most powerful form of human freedom of expression that I've that's ever been created, in my view. Welcome to Doha Debates. In each episode, we present opposing sides of an urgent issue and search for common ground. Get ready for a conversation that's smart, spirited, civil, and respectful. If you like what you hear in these debates, click like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Joshua Johnson, and I have spent my career as a journalist helping people debate their differences, especially issues of democracy and culture. So today's topic definitely intrigues me. Artificial intelligence and the arts. Is AI helping? Is it doing more harm than good? Now, perhaps you don't know much about AI, but I bet you use it all the time. Have you ever unlocked your phone just by looking at it? Have you ever written an email or a document and then your computer suggested the next word or the next phrase? Well, AI does all these things. And that's evolving with programs like Microsoft's ChatGPT or Bard AI from Google. Now computers are starting to perform more complex tasks that we used to think only humans could do. Things like writing essays or mimicking voices or driving cars or diagnosing diseases. Supporters say that AI could revolutionize humanity. Critics say that that revolution could threaten jobs and livelihoods and even artistic expression. In Hollywood, writers and actors went on strike partly over those concerns. We will not be having our jobs taken away and given to robots. The issue is whether studios will limit how AI is used. For example, if a computer creates a new performance based on your previous acting, one that looks like you and sounds just like you, should you have any control over that new performance? Should you even get paid for it? These questions don't have any easy answers, but that's what we're going to focus on today with our two debaters. And let me introduce you to them right now. First, Jason Allen is an art creator and a tabletop game designer based in Pueblo, West Colorado. He's used AI to make his artwork, and he says it's a helpful tool to spur creativity rather than to steal it. Jason, welcome to the debate. Good to have you with us. Hello, Joshua. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Also joining us is Molly Crabapple. She is an artist and writer based in New York. She argues that generative AI corporations built their products on stolen artwork. Molly, welcome. Good to have you with us. Hey, happy to be here. We also have some global listeners who will chime in on today's discussion, and we'll bring them in a little bit later in the debate. We'll keep this super conversational, so you don't have to raise your hand and wait for the teacher. Just feel free to jump in. But before we begin, I have two rules. First, and this should be no problem, but just to put it on the record, we're here to pick apart the issue, not each other. No personal attacks, please. And second, and this is my personal pet peeve, don't answer a question with a question. It's perfectly okay to think out loud if a question has you stumped. But don't duck the issue by pivoting to something else. You're free to raise questions as we go along, but every question needs an answer. Jason, let's start with you. You won the Blue Ribbon Prize for Emerging Digital Artists at the Colorado State Fair, and you created your piece using an AI program called MidJourney. Tell us how MidJourney works and how you used it to make your submission for the contest. Sure. So... Of course, MidJourney, right? This revolutionary new software. It's a form of artificial intelligence that uses deep learning in conjunction with diffusion. It's on the uh, social media platform Discord. So it's a, it's a public facing software. You enter a prompt into the text field using the forward slash imagine command and it sends that text to the server where it uses this algorithm to translate your text into an interpretation of a visual form that we call art. <laughs> so this artwork is the output and I've had nothing but the most positive experience uh, using, using MidJourney. It's the most aesthetically pleasing, I feel, of all of the different platforms. There's many out there, of course, and I've tried a lot of them. 
But I want to be clear, though. You uh, forgive me interrupting. I just want to make sure I'm clear. You literally told this app, imagine, and then wrote the thing that you wanted it to visualize. And it used the data in its database to try to match up with what you requested. Is that kind of the way it works? Essentially, what you're saying is accurate. It's it's understanding what you're saying and what you're asking for. And if it doesn't understand what you're saying, it's going to use its best ability to interpret what you're saying to uh, create the output that it believes that you're looking for. And uh, it's an interplay and dance between man and machine. Uh, without the human element, these, these outputs could never be created. And I think that's really important to stress that um, the AI isn't going off on its own and just creating these pieces of work without human influence. That's why it's called a multimodal system. It actually requires human interaction in order to operate. Give me your views on AI and artwork in a nutshell. We'll obviously go into deeper detail as the debate goes on, but as you see it, what's in bounds, what's out of bounds, where do you draw the line? Sure. So in my opinion, as if you're not breaking the law, there shouldn't be anything outside of the limit. Art is limitless, right? And obviously, there's been a very big controversy surrounding all this. Uh, I don't... I'd, I'm surprised that artists are so vehemently against... Well, not all artists. I don't want to make a sweeping indictment across the entire art community. But they are certainly the... Uh, most vocal about uh, their opinions regarding it, and it's controversial. So in my view, art is about challenging worldviews and shaking up people's opinions and sparking debates like this one. <laughs> so uh, honestly, I think AI, you know, of course, is a revolutionary technology, but and it's changing everything in the world that we know and live in. But I like to see the positive side of these things. For me, in particular, with art, it's like an imagination feedback loop. So I'll present an idea that I conceived in my mind's eye using my creativity and imagination into the software, and it'll come back with a completion or an output, the image. And I'll see it, and I'm like, yeah, this is exactly what I'm talking about, but also this, right? So it will perform in ways that are maybe unexpected or a surprise. And that gives me new ideas. That's like, oh, well, I didn't think of that before. So when I say it's an imagination feedback loop, I could stay on this all day. You know, just like, oh, that gives me this new idea. That gives me this new idea. So I'm venturing out into the vast abyss that we call latent space. I'm a latent space explorer, <laughs> discovering amazing new things that the human mind couldn't possibly comprehend but it is very definitely a human creation. Let me bring Molly in and ask you similarly about that. What Jason is describing is what we call generative AI, where you put something in and the machine gives something back, which is different, say, from the system that you know recognizes your face when you unlock your phone. Give me your sense of what the boundaries should be for this kind of generative AI. Like most illustrators, I have been horrified by the profusion of products put out by these generative AI companies. Now, when we talk about image generators like Midjourney, Dolly, like Stable Diffusion, I want to be really clear what we're talking about. We're talking about companies that are funded by tens of billions of dollars by some of the most malignant actors in Silicon Valley who scrape the internet for billions upon billions of images many of them copyrighted. These aren't just illustrations or photo or, you know, professional photographs. These are private medical images. These are pictures of your kid. Then they took these images, they used them without the consent, without compensation, without even telling the creators. They used these images to train their generators. The only reason that any image generator is good is because it was trained on billions and billions of stolen images. That is where the images come from. Now, this might seem bad enough, right? That these you know, huge corporations with so much money are taking images from you know, working artists like myself um, to make products without paying us. 
But the thing that's even worse is that the purpose of these products is to de-skill, to disempower, and to ultimately replace working artists. The products are good enough to spit out a you know, somewhat soulless facsimile of the work of any artist that they're trained on. If you type my work into Dolly right now, you can see tons of, um, you know, fake Molly Crabapple drawings in my style. And it is using our stolen work to take our jobs. That phrase you used, soulless facsimile, kind of struck me. It, it resonates with an open letter that you signed on to with the Center for Artistic Inquiry and Reporting. Among other things, the letter reads in part, quote, generative AI art is vampirical, feasting on past generations of artwork, even as it sucks the lifeblood from living artists, unquote. Explain that. Sucks the lifeblood from living artists? What do you mean by that? Well, me and you, we're people. We need to put food on the table, right? We need to pay our rent, need to pay our mortgage. What generative AI does is it allows your boss to spit out images of your work without needing to pay you. So when I say sucking the lifeblood, what I mean is literally taking the food off of the table of working artists. And this is exactly what the Screen Actors Guild and what the Writers Guild of America are fighting for. They know that what studios want is to use um, generative AI to replace them, to cut off the jobs of 90% of the industry, 99%, leave a small elite and replace everyone else with soulless facsimiles. Jason, let me ask you about the way that you use AI platforms like MidJourney. Do you feel like you need them, that you could do without them? I mean, how did you create art before you started using AI or did you? Yeah, I mean, I grew up drawing and painting. I'm a creative person. I never pursued it as a career, more like a hobby. Um, nobody can tell you how to make your art. And uh, I chose to use MidJourney to create my work. It was the form with which I chose to express myself. It's uh, the most powerful form of human freedom of expression that I've that's ever been created, in my view. And I feel like for anybody to be against that, to have a technology that's powerful enough to democratize the art making process and putting it in the hands of anybody that wants it, I think to be against that, I think that's anti-art. I think that's anti-people. So essentially to be anti-AI is equivalent to being anti-people. In a sense, a lot of times art and technology go hand in hand as we move along. And Holly, let me get to... Oh, go ahead, Jason. Well, I mean, there's, so there's still paintings. There's still books. There's still movies. You know, like movies didn't replace theater. Uh, cameras didn't replace painting. Um, chat GPT isn't going to replace books, uh, mid journey and these image synthesis programs aren't going to replace artists. It's, there's always going to be a market for these things. It's inherently it's a in much smaller market, a much, much, much smaller and lower paid market. Well, that's, I think the issue, Molly, and I want to, I want to get into that with you as well, but I, I also kind of hear what Jason is getting at in terms of the nature of art being naturally an evolving kind of collection of processes. There's another part of your open letter about AI, a few other parts. Let me just quote two quick sentences side by side. It reads in part, quote, it, meaning generative AI, it creates only ersatz versions of illustrations, having no actual insight, wit, or originality. And further down in the letter, quote, over time, this will impoverish our visual culture, unquote. That's a really strong condemnation of a medium that's barely in its infancy. I mean, how is this technology such an existential threat to art? Because it can work faster and cheaper than any human can. Anyone who um, knows anything about how companies work knows that most of them are looking to maximize their bottom line at any cost. And if there is a way to avoid paying people, 
they will do it. I'm completely uninterested in conversations about whether this will destroy the fire of human creativity in people's souls. You know, people's souls, that's their own affair. What I'm interested in is the economics of it and how this is going to destroy the lives of any working creator. Now, you talked to me, you asked me about how it will impoverish visual culture. One of the things about AI is that it produces huge, huge quantities of images and of words and of content. And these quantities of content are ready to, I think they've actually already surpassed every, the just sheer quantity of images that were created before it. So what's going to happen is that as sort of like these, you know, like these ersatz knockoff images flood the internet, the generators are fed on themselves. They push artists out of, you know, advertising, out of book covers, out of posters, out of all of the sort of visual culture they're already doing, we're just going to have a visual landscape that is, you know, it's just bad. I mean, it's the same way that our government, you know, funds like high fructose corn syrup and industrial agriculture, and most people eat food that's really bad. We just get used to lower quality stuff if that's what's foisted on us. Jason, I wonder if you can empathize with what Molly is trying to say, particularly the economic piece, and especially for people in different parts of the world. I mean, it's one thing to talk about SAG-AFTRA, the union that represents actors, and the Writers Guild of America, which represents a lot of professional writers in entertainment, in news and sports as well, that they're concerned that they will be replaced altogether, especially now that the streaming economy is also upending the way that art is made. There's all of these economic forces buffeting industries that used to look bulletproof. And I can only imagine what it's like in parts of the world like the global south, like developing countries that have very different economies where the livelihoods of people are even more precarious, especially artists who depend on being able to sell their bespoke handmade work to feed their families. Jason, can you empathize with how exploited these artists must feel, even at the prospect of what AI can do, just exploited by the possibility that some computer in a cloud somewhere could prevent them from feeding their children? Okay, so art has historically been the playground of the elite and the privileged few who can afford to spend their time creating rather than laboring. This is leaving countless voices unheard, people who have to work, labor, hard jobs, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. Uh, they don't have time to create the things that they imagine in their mind's eye. Uh, they want to bring their vision into form, but they're just not afforded the same opportunity. And I, I'm just confused how you could oppose AI's potential to break down these barriers, giving a voice to those without the means to express themselves artistically, but uh, to, to the point of re replacing artists. Um, it, it's actually helping established artists iterate faster and improve upon their workflow and serve as a reliable and priceless conceptual tool. Those who are adopting it, who aren't afraid of it, who actually spend their time to research it and understand how it works. It's an imagination feedback loop, like I mentioned. People are still buying paintings. Photography didn't replace painting. Movies uh, didn't replace theatrical performances. Recorded music didn't replace live concerts. To say that AI art is going to replace artists is a misrep misrepresentation of history. I, I'm curious if you are just afraid of competing against a, an AI user creating art. Is that is that what's going on? Is Have you been comfortable so long with the way that you've decided to conduct your business that you aren't willing to adapt and grow? Because so these are very interesting questions, Jason. Um, and I find it interesting that you're so focused on feelings as opposed to facts. No. What do you mean by that, Molly? Yeah, that's no. interesting. So he talks about feelings, right? Feelings of competition, feelings of fear, all of these things, right? What you're not talking about is the facts that these are billion dollar companies that stole the work of countless artists to produce products that actually, you're right, I can't actually create a painting in three minutes. No artist can create a painting in three minutes. No artist can live off of 
creating stuff for free forever. It is not physically possible for any artist to compete economically. With, with Airsoft's images? Exactly. I see. So it's not. The thing is that it won't matter if the images are good. What matters is that they're cheap and that they're fast. And it is not possible for any artist to work as cheap and as fast. Now, the thing that to me is so interesting is you call it an imagination feedback loop. Mm. It's not your imagination. It's a corporate tool. It's a corporate tool that was fed on billions of stolen images. The idea that it is less democratic for people to use a pencil that costs pennies than to have to use this corporate tool funded by billions of dollars just to think of ideas is ridiculous. It's laughable to me. Molly, give me dig a little bit deeper, if you would. I, I, forgive me. I should have asked you to clarify this in the beginning, and I didn't. When we talk about the economics of being an artist, can you paint that picture a little more clearly for me? Because, you know, there are artists and there are artists and there are artists. And the economics of being, you know, George Clooney are not the same as the economics of being Georgia O'Keeffe, which are not the same as the economics of being, you know, Rembrandt versus being Beyonce, right? All artists, but very different economics. Give me a picture of what you see, Molly, at least just from your vantage point, in terms of what those economics are from, and I, again, different artists around the world are dealing with different things. But what do you see in terms of the line that artists are trying to walk to take care of themselves? So this is a really, really good question. And it's important that I clarify this now in that when we use the word artist, we're talking about two different things or two different sort of economic fields. One of them is people who sell their work at galleries, um, sometimes, you know, for millions and millions of dollars. Right. And the way that a gallery artist works is that they try to sell single objects for as much money as they possibly can. Like at the end of the goal, that's at the, at the end of the day, that's your goal, right? To like auction off one painting, you know, for $10 million to some oligarch somewhere. Um, then the other thing that we mean when we say artists is we mean illustrators. And that's where I come out of. And I think that's where Jason comes out of as well. Uh, and that is people who are creating images to be on like a book cover, magazine cover, you know, comic book, um, you know, doing like concept art behind a Hollywood movie. I don't think that AI is going to hurt people who are selling a $10 million painting that their studio assistants painted for them, right? That's not what it's about. It's about whether these apps are going to um, get rid of basically the entire creative working class. And I think it's the same thing that we see in the actors strike. They are not worried that like, you know, AI is going to impoverish George Clooney. It's not about that. George Clooney has a lot of power. They're worried about um, background actors getting their likenesses scanned and the and those likenesses like being reproduced and used for the rest of those for the, for the rest of time without those actors consent. They're worried about basically the uh, ladder into a creative field being kicked out so that there's no um, generation of young people that will have any sort of entry level jobs to rise up. Well, let me ask you about that, Jason. When you saw the piece of art in Mid Journey, the one that won you the award in an art competition, but set the competition aside for a second. When you saw the art for the first time, what went through your head? What went through your heart when the computer presented that back to you? So it was a, a long iterative process. I spent 80 plus hours to arrive at Theatre du Opera Spatial. I have thousands of space opera theater images, you realize. But when I found, and so there's so many more that are like this that I haven't shared. And a lot of that is due to the fact that I can't protect my work. I'm being left with no recourse because the United States Copyright Office also believes that I didn't create this work. But to answer your question, uh, this is the exact type of aesthetic and em emotion that I was trying to evoke is this grand opera type stage, right? Where I'm using concepts like anachronism, pareidolia, and uh, nostalgia to make it so that your eyes just can't stop, that can't look away. And, you know, uh, it's, it's being presented as though we are showing the future of our present 
to one of the great masters of the past and having them depict that scene. And I feel like I accomplished that. So you said that there are other images that you have, but you haven't shared them because you're not sure if the U.S. Copyright Office will protect them, will acknowledge them as yours. Did I hear that right? Oh, yeah. Well, I already know for a fact that they won't. We're, at, we're the tip of the spear in the copyright battle right now. Well, our first reconsideration was denied, but we got that response. And now our second request is currently pending. Sorry, I, I misstated that. If they, if they deny this request again for the copyright of Teatro de Opera Spacial, we will be entered into the first district court. Uh, but yeah, that's I, I'm being faced with the challenge of how am I going to share my work knowing that anybody could take it and use it however they want. And I'm, I know exactly how Molly would feel about that. It's like, aha, see, you don't yeah. want your work to be used in a way that you didn't consent to. And I'm like, yeah. Obviously, nobody does. But the problem is, is they did consent. And it's a red herring. The entire consent argument is a misdirection tactic. They don't need your consent. It's transformative use. I'm sorry. It sounds like the two of you kind of have split pieces of the same problem here in terms of being able to protect the work that you make and the benefits that will kind of build down from that over time. I wonder if maybe you've got pieces of the same problem. I want to come back to that because there may be some common ground there between the two of you. But sit tight for one second. We have some global listeners who've been paying attention to this debate, and I want to bring them in before we try to kind of wrap the whole thing up. They have some questions of their own. First, let's meet Mutinta Masoi. She's an educator and founder of a digital education hub, and she's joining us from Zambia. Welcome to Doha Debates. What's on your mind? All right. Thank you very much uh, for having me on the platform. So I'm um, wondering, I've been hearing from both sides, where I think on the other side, it's being mentioned AI is kind of like toxic, if in a lack of a better term. On the other side, AI is okay. It's and uh, a one way on how you can become innovative with your art and so on and so forth. But I'm wondering, coming from a least developed country, where you find that a number of uh, young people here, first of all, don't have jobs. And we find that investors from different countries come to invest in our country. And hence, most of the young people get jobs here. And not just young people, but a lot of people get jobs in these companies that mostly foreigners come in our country and invest. But then if you introduce AI, and if they introduce AI, and they are already like maybe five steps ahead of us who are living in Africa or who are living in the least developed countries, don't you think when we say it's a danger to human beings, we're going to be left behind? Jason, let me start with you on this one. It, it sounds like the concern is what AI could mean in a number of people's hands. On one side, the possibility that people who are in developing countries in the global south and elsewhere could be exploited by people who already have this technology in their hands. On the other side, the possibility that if they don't get in on this technology, they'll be even further left behind in the developing world as it develops even faster. So maybe there's a piece of this problem for each of you to take on. Jason, let me start with you and your response to what Mutinta Masoe shared with us. Jason? Right, so I think that this reveals the essence of, of that argument. I, I think that the question isn't about whether or not there should be an indictment on the technology itself, but rather on the people who decide to use it, whether it's for good or for bad. And that's kind of everything, right? Like. Historically, we have seen technology used in a way to enrich our lives. And I'm certain that no one has a crystal ball and can say with certainty what is absolutely going to happen. Um, like, you know, it's going to replace all creativity and it's going to take away everybody's jobs. Uh, well, historically, we haven't seen that. We've seen paradigm shifts. We've seen us as a species adapting and moving forward and advancing, which is good, growing pains, et cetera. But, you know, ultimately it's a question of how are you going to choose to use this technology? 
to help people and benefit your life and those around you, or in a malicious and malignant way that's actually going to harm and deter people. And I can't help you with those decisions. So Molly? So one thing um, that often gets left out of AI conversations is the climate impact of AI. Obviously, the we're, the world is burning alive. We all know that. I mean, look at the look at the heat the heat the heat waves now. Look at the ecological destruction. Um, to train generative AI models is incredibly incredibly costly in terms of carbon. It is far more costly than to um, run a um, to run a uh, chat GPT style search than it is just to run like a regular Google search. And uh, it's costly in the same way that, you know, Bitcoin is. But the difference between its energy impact and Bitcoins is that um, people can use AI in an unlimited way. I mean, Jason was just talking about how he's just sitting there clicking and clicking and clicking to get more and more images. This unlimited proliferation of incredibly carbon intensive AI is a massive, massive climate threat. Let's also hear from Alanud Alakidi, who is joining us from Qatar. She's an artist who's used AI to assist her work. And she has a question about AI and its use in music. Welcome to the debates. What's on your mind? Hi. So as musical artist Grimes has made the AI to clone her voice, and split 50% of royalties on any successful AI-generated song that uses her voice. AI could enhance artistic creativity, but as the other side of it is where they're not taking profit, I have another example of uh, Sean Gunn, who is an actor for, for the TV show Gilmore Girls, and he is protesting against and striking at Netflix because they are streaming one of the most successful TV shows on Netflix where he and among other actors are gaining zero profit or little to none profit from that. So do you feel like there is a way to balance out the monetization uh, in a realistic aspect or would that allow for the AI generating companies to lose their billions? That is a great question. Molly, could I put that to you first? So let me talk a bit about Grimes. The thing that's interesting about her proposal is that right now the generators already allow anyone to make fake Grimes songs. Um, recently, there was a case where like a fake Drake song was put out the same way. Um, She's actually not in a position to ask for 50% royalties um, because she no longer owns the rights to her voice, thanks to these generators. Um, but I think that she's doing it for publicity and obviously she's massively wealthy. And so there's no real you know, downside. The thing is that once it's possible to duplicate someone's voice, someone's performance, someone's likeness, and once it's... Um, allowed legally, there's no way that that's going to go back to the artists. Alanud, I want to hear from you and Mutinta in just a moment when we wrap up. I do want to give you both, Jason, Molly, a lot of credit for being willing to engage in something that's this thorny. There are no easy answers to this. This is all still very much shaking out. And there are a lot of very strong feelings on both sides. I think you've both expressed why this is so pertinent for you and personal, that this is actually affecting real people. And if nothing else, I think that our conversation today has helped to crystallize that a bit more for people who may be newer to this issue. We focused on your differences so far and your differences of opinion on this. I'd like to see if there's any common ground. Molly, let me stick with you for just a second. Are there any things that you've heard from Jason today that you either agree with or empathize with or feel some common ground with him on, or are you two completely at polar opposites? I think that we're, I think you'd agree with me, Jason. I think we're pretty opposite on many things. Um, one thing that Jason said that it's not something that I feel common ground with, but it's a common sentiment in our culture is that uh, Jason to me seems to be a belief in the inevitability of technological progress. The idea that technology always advances, it's always for the better, any technological development is good, and you know people just need to adopt to it. 
And that's not something I believe in. I believe there are bad technologies. I believe that mustard gas was bad and it was it's good that we banned it. I also believe that technologies have winners and losers. So Jason, any common ground with Molly? Uh, common ground. I wish I wish we could. Honestly, um, I'm I'm curious I, if we could find common ground. If she would be open and willing to take the steps to grasp how deep learning and diffusion models function, but it seems she's more interested in uh, staying willfully ignorant about how the technology works rather than facing the reality of how it's not infringing. Well, I it will. Hang on. I don't think that's fair. I think there I think there is common ground between the two of you. You two can't hear it. I can. Both of you have expressed a desire to have your work protected. Molly, you're talking about protecting the work of journeyman working class artists whose work is being kind of ground up and reshaped Soylent Green style in these generative AI systems. Jason, you expressed a desire to have your work protected by the U.S. Copyright Office, and you're fighting over that right now. You've both conceded that your art matters to you. That's the common ground. You are both part of this. You perceive its benefits differently, but you're both part of this change that's happening. And maybe that's the possibility for empathy. If you can at least understand that what you're feeling about this is vivid and powerful. And neither of you knows what the future is, but you both want to be protected. Jason, you want to be protected in your capacity to use this technology as you see fit. Molly, you want to be protected in your capacity to pay your rent and your bills and either use it or not, but you're both looking for validation and respect. Am I wrong? I, I agree. I agree with that to a certain extent. I recognize Molly as an artist and that the work that she creates is art and she wants to protect it. But she Molly, does. am I wrong about that? Um, I, I'm not. Sh I'm not sure. I'm in, in agreement, but I find it a very noble statement. Let me go back to our global listeners for some final reflections. Uh, Alanud, let me start with you. If you both could pe keep it mutinta, Alanud, keep it very, very, very brief. Thirty seconds or so. Just your final reflections on everything we've discussed. Alanud, let me start with you very briefly. Final thoughts on what we've discussed. I feel like the main issue is not the artists, but the major corporations that need to manage the way they distribute their tools. And Mutin, to final thought from you very briefly. So what I learned from the conversation is we still have a lot to, to do because we have not yet reached an agreement of what we should do. But from my analysis is that AI is here to stay whether we like it or not, it's here to stay because like the world has gone digital now. And in as much as we are trying to have AI with us, we also need to make sure that we look at the smaller details that society holds. So that's my, actually, I think that's my take home message regarding the AI. Yeah. I will say there is one other piece of, I don't know if it's common ground, but a commonality between the two of you. And that is that you are both willing to engage in something that's very uncomfortable and very difficult that does not have easy answers. I'm really grateful for the passion you both brought to this debate, for the insights you've brought, for being willing to just sit in the discomfort, which is something that not a lot of people are willing to do, but that we're going to have to do if we're going to find a way forward through this new frontier of technology. So thank you both very, very much for being part of today's Doha debate. Molly Crabapple, appreciate you making the time. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. And Jason Allen, thank you. Thank you, Joshua. It was a pleasure to meet you both. Thank you, Molly. Thanks also to our global listeners, Mutinta Masoi and Alanud Alakidi. And thank you for listening to Doha Debates. This is a production of Qatar Foundation. Our podcast is produced by FP Studios and Doha Debates. Our producers include Ashley Westerman, Rosie Julin, Claudia Tatey, and Katrine Dermody. Special thanks also to James Woolley. FP Studios Managing Director is Rob Sachs. Our executive producers are Jafit Weeks, Amjad Atala, and Jigar Mehta. To learn more about Doha Debates, go to DohaDebates.com. That's D-O-H-A Debates.com. You can find out more about our other podcasts, short films, upcoming events, and more. 
Please follow and review this podcast. Share it with someone. See what they think of the arguments you just heard. You might just spark another debate all your own. And be sure to check out my podcast, The Nightlight, which is all about democracy, culture, and solving the problems we share. You'll find it at nightlightshow.com. So until we meet again, I'm Joshua Johnson. Thanks for listening.